Hi everyone and welcome to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel. I'm a draftsman and also the host of the show that you're about to watch called The Conversation About Art. During this podcast, I asked, uh, I asked my guests, what is art and what is beauty? And we talk about that. And today I offer you episode 92 and I will be talking with my guest, Amber Anderson, who is an artist. She likes insects and nature and that is really quite cool and also skulls and those things are awesome and so we're going to talk about these things today if you want to support my channel it is very much appreciated you can do so by liking and sharing the video leaving a comment um, and subscribing to my audiovisual channel those are really helpful you can also purchase my drawings directly from my website by prints of my drawings leave me a tip and all of those things are greatly appreciated so let's get on with this episode um, Mrs. Amber Anderson, welcome to my podcast. Again, you're episode 92. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Hi, I'm Amber Anderson, as you just said, and I'm an artist living and working in a very rural Woodward, Oklahoma. And I work mostly in watercolor, um, but you know, there's other mediums that I like to explore as well. And I'm also the gallery director at a small gallery and studio. In fact, the only one in our city um, called Larry Cahill Studios. And um, I basically organize all of the events. We work really hard to get our art into the community here. And then I talk to artists about um, exhibiting at our gallery. And I also teach classes here. <laughs> nice. OK, OK, OK. Um, it's a kind of tangential thing about the name of the gallery, the name of the guy, because every time that you write it, uh, you know, like on the yeah. Instagram, whatever it is, I always kind of switch out the H with the K. So I will read it first, Larry H. Kill. <laughs> so, and, and, and like the <laughs> username also, you know? Of the oh, yeah. And it's, it's kind of funny. Um, I always have, I don't know if it's like some kind of weird, I mean, as far as I know, I don't have dyslexia, but it's like amusing that I'm like, what is, what, which one is it? Okay. Um, I would like it if you told me, talk to me a little bit more about your usage of watercolor um, because I feel like you've mostly been doing watercolor for your personal work because I know that you do murals and you probably don't use water watercolor for that, but I mean like for your, yeah, <laughs> for it's, it's the rain and it's ruined, you know, um, yeah. but, but for your personal work, how long have you been mainly using watercolor and why? Um, I think it's been about five years. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to university, I of course was introduced to oil and I loved using oil, um, but then I had children and um, watercolor is just a safer medium and it's easier to put down and pick up and deal with children yeah yeah um a lot of it'll be just like out of nowhere and the baby will wake up from a nap or whatever early and okay. so it's hard to find around them um watercolor will not change you know it it'll dry immediately and i don't have to worry about drying times if i'm gonna go back and rework anything like that um and it's uh, I didn't learn how to use it when I was in university. I just kind of got some watercolor that were on sale one time uh -huh. um, to try. And um, I didn't really like it at first, but you know, there was a lot of just practice and playing around with it. And I eventually came to love it and figured out how to layer like a ton. And yeah, it's just really fun. Okay. Yeah, the reason of using it because you have children makes a lot of sense because uh, it's like, what else could you use? Maybe gouache, yeah. I guess? Yeah, um, it's pretty similar to watercolor in that it's, you know, you don't have to worry about drying times or anything like that. Um, and then I, graphite, I used to do a ton of graphite mm. and charcoal. But... Yes. Okay. Um... And you used a word that I thought was interesting as a descriptor for watercolor. Oh, that it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is weird because, I mean, I don't have the experience with watercolor that you do, obviously, and the, ex the experience that many other people that I've interviewed have, which is 
I don't know, a lot, you know, you can obviously make finished works and do things with it. So then that means that you have this familiarity with the material. Uh, but, but watercolor definitely has like the reputation of being like unruly and kind of unpredictable and the water will like drip in a way. And then kind of like the, you know, how it does that thing where like the edges, if you put like a drop, like a little puddle of water and you put color there, then like the edges are darker sort of and like it's kind of lighter you know when it dries i don't know i mean i don't know if that sounds rambly or something but you know watercolor has this reputation so i guess i wonder what you mean by that it doesn't change for like an oil painting if i have to set it down for a while the oil might dry before i can get back and finish working a certain area mm. whereas with watercolor I can go back and rework an area as much as I want, as long as I don't tear up the paper, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, that's what I mean by that. And then as far as like the unpredictability about uh, the using a lot of water with your paint, um, I do like the unpredictability for my um, underpainting. Mm. But uh, when it comes to adding the details or like the finer, like shading and rendering aspects of it. Um, I use a lot of wet on dry method and um, I always wipe off my brush in just very tiny amounts of watercolor and that prevents from the underlayer from being brought up or it's spreading or doing anything unpredictable. Very interesting. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, All right, give me a second. Okay. <laughs> so, I guess having the availability of graphite and gouache as, or well, maybe even pastel, I guess, or I don't know, even egg temper. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of like things that I, that wouldn't be harmful to kids. I, I don't know, I guess, mm -hmm. about egg temper, but. I'm not entirely sure about egg tempera because I mean the egg part obviously is not a problem but then the pigments might be but then I guess that's applicable to watercolor as well like the pigment itself might be a problem but yeah I think most of them are pretty well okay okay um but then having all the you know like the availability of all those other mediums I suppose then why did you stick with watercolor anyway why have you stuck with it like i mean i don't know do you have a curiosity about the other ones or well I, you know i've worked in uh, graphite quite a bit and charcoal and i really really loved those mediums and i still do i use them often and um there's with black and white it's all about rendering you know just the three-dimensional aspect of things mm -hmm. um and value, but with watercolor, I'm able to explore different color combinations and seeing how that affects the mood of the work. Or, um, you know, a lot of times it, I'll use like a color that's unnatural. For instance, in one of my paintings, there's like some mushrooms and the underside was like pretty much all blue, but it reads as just a shadow, even though it's blue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, like bright blue <laughs> and I find that really fun to be able to um, play and make these almost fantasy like worlds but they still read as something that's real and normal okay. um, and it's a lot of fun that way okay um, which one so so you so like when you're making so the work that you make like the subject matter i mean why why did, why would you refer to it as a like a fantasy world because like the mushroom it isn't a bright blue or that same painting the trees are purple um but they don't read as purple when you look at the picture mm -hmm. i don't i don't know if it's, like fantasy would be the trees are purple and the mushrooms are blue but yes. um when you look at it it doesn't read that way and so it's like a secret fantasy world I don't know <laughs> or it doesn't seem fantasy like at first but then um if you if you really look at all the pieces put together 
um, you know, separate the pieces out, you can say, oh, those tree trunks are all purple or the underside of that mushroom is all blue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, I mean, does that mean that you kind of do a thing where the purple of the tree or the blue of the mushroom isn't immediately visible? I mean, they're purple, but uh, a lot of it's, I try to render things to look exactly right and the tops of the mushrooms are brown, you know? And so um, the fact that it's the underside that's blue reads as a shadow and it's like a cool tone. So that also helps it read as a shadow. Mm -hmm. um, same for the trees, they're like in the background. So um, it could be like a night scene. Are great, but, uh, it's like a, a forest scene. Um, and it's like everything's kind of in shadow. Mm -hmm. So all of the cool tones, it's it's not instantly the first thing you notice that like everything is an abnormal color. Mm -hmm. um, so it's fun to like play with the color in that way. Okay. Yeah, that does sound fun uh, to kind of to kind of build that while you're making the work and then to kind of enjoy the way that it looks once it's finished with that same kind of playfulness. Yes, it's super playful. It's almost like I'm tricking tricking you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you don't instantly see that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so then why would you want to introduce that into the imagery that you make instead of, for example, just painting a realistic tree, for example? <laughs> I think it's um, the challenge. And also, it's just I really like it turns out I enjoy using color uh -huh. and so, um, it's fun and it's the playful aspect I really enjoy. Um, it's just more enjoyable. Okay. Yes, but um, I guess I'd like, I'd like to know what it what exactly is that or if you I don't know if you've like thought about it much or, or anything but um maybe if I grill you enough about it <laughs> you you'll, 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 you you yeah 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 it's like what what do you what where do you think the enjoyment of and not and not that it isn't because I mean I I enjoy both you know like of mm -hmm. course I like regular trees and I mean I'm sure you do as well you enjoy regular bugs and uh, regular trees and plants yeah. and whatever but then you know, you also have fun with changing their colors. So then I wonder, you know, I, I wonder, I don't know, what do you think about that? I'm not really sure. I think uh, I find, um, way to stump me, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, it's kind of like, I'm creating these, it's a window into an entire world that I create. And in a way that the viewer, like you or anyone else that looks, is creating their own world based on this little window of a world in my head. Mm -hmm. And it's not real and it's not out there. Um, and it's an exploration of how these, these colors come together and make something look um i'm not a hundred percent sure i really enjoy color mixing like just the i like watching the colors come together and layering them on top of each other and things like that and i think that is a big part of why i do this <laughs> i don't know um i really used to love working only in black and white with graphite and charcoal i did that a ton and um picking up the watercolor uh, has just been truly a, an exploration with myself through that, like um, charcoal and graphite, any of those kind of things. Um, you know, I went to university and everyone taught me how to use them and how to see real things. Um, but there's an introspective, like finding it myself that has come with watercolor because I, 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 my only experience is through my own exploration mm. and exploring how to 
combine colors and create scenes and um, develop value ranges with color has just been, uh, you know, it's like my own discoveries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And, and what do you, what do you think? I mean, no, not what do you think? What are you discovering? A lot of, uh, just the way colors interact, how far I can push a color and it still, still feel realistic in some way, or, um, just how to use the media in general, um, and things like that all were self discover like discovering through my own volition and um, mm. having that that alone time to figure those things out and yeah I think exploring something and finding it for yourself has a lot to do with how much I enjoy um, painting or drawing or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That makes a lot of sense. And it also makes a lot of sense, actually, like now that I guess grilled you enough <laughs> about the watercolor, the, uh, for, for me to understand, at least, because obviously you understand just fine, but, but um, for, me to, for me to understand kind of like your taste for the watercolor. <coughs> so um, it makes a lot of sense that be because it was like self-directed study, and kind of you've you've like been able to learn just all by yourself and i mean even 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 if even if you're you know as as you're learning you're kind of trying to make your way through the medium yes but but like yeah like like that journey with the medium like trying to have the try to learn the trying to learn the medium something i mean just basically from scratch um in a way you know I mean, that makes a lot of sense that if you liked what you were doing through that search, like that journey, that makes a lot of sense that it would, that you would have kind of like a, not a soft spot exactly, maybe, I mean, kind of like a soft spot, but I, but I, I feel like soft spots are like a weakness or something. And it's obviously something yeah. that has added a lot to your work and just obviously for yourself, the appreciation and kind of learning that you can learn a thing by yourself and kind of like going through the any struggles by yourself and resolving them by yourself so then it makes a lot of sense that you would like develop this relation like tight yeah. re tight relationship yeah tight relationship with the medium yeah 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 what do you think about that does that make sense yes everything you said you hit a nail on the head yes <laughs> okay good um okay and um I'd like it if you if you talked a little bit about the subject matter of your work. Mm. Uh, so, yes, go ahead. Sorry. Um, you know, I draw a lot of bugs and a lot of mushrooms and a lot of like forest floor little bitty guys. Um, and originally, um, that started back like in high school and college. Um, that I started incorporating those a lot when I was about that age. Um, and I think a lot of it just had to do with uh, feeling um, outcast or less than or whatever. And people have that same kind of attitude toward like insects and things like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. um, like, ew, gross or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I felt bad for them, and I felt like that kind of, I'm like, I could see myself in the bug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, I just found them incredibly beautiful and intricate and machine-like, but natural, and all of these things that are just, and, you know, there's so many kinds, and there's so many colors, and uh, funny shapes, very alien, and I just found myself falling in love with them, finding them fun to paint or draw or whatever and I uh, loved including them in my work for that you know uh, relationship where I felt very outcast very um, other or unloved or whatever um, so that's uh, kind of where I started incorporating them and what their purpose was in my work 
Um, and then all of that was inspired by uh, my childhood. I lived very rural and our house, it was actually my grandma's house. <laughs> and I, she just watched me after school. So after school, you know, her house is entirely surrounded by woods and there's a creek and I would spend my entire day until dinner time or even later, um, just exploring the woods all by myself, little bitty kid and overturning logs and rocks and all the things, walking along the creek and catching crawdads and fish, all that. Um, and I fell in love with the little creatures at a very young age. And so, um, you know, always loving them and then feeling that outcast and then going to college and being able to, you know, render them and observe all of their tiny little details. Yeah, I just love them. And then more recently in my work, I have started adding in a figure aspect to you um and a lot more just general forest style uh elements um anything like the woods like plants the moss insects um small critters like frogs and toads um trees and a lot of that has to do with um uh, I try to use the life and death cycle of the forest floor to represent um, a part of me having gone through a lot of tragic things in my life. Mm -hmm. um, part of me as a person dying figuratively and then a new part of me being born from that, you know, mm -hmm. decay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's where I, uh, and that's kind of the idea that I'm trying to embody mm -hmm. these days. So, um, I use a lot of that forest floor life and death cycle where a tree falls and it becomes food for the insects and the mushrooms and breaks down into soil and becomes food for the plants and mm -hmm. then, you know, it begins again. And, um, I think it's a really beautiful symbolism for the experiences that I've gone through. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I li I li yeah, I like that as subject matter a lot. Be uh, spe um, well, I like everything about it, but I in particular like the cyclical nature of everything, of nature. Because um, I kind of feel like we, you know, humans are either taught otherwise or feel like things are finite or, you know, a little bit of both, you know, feels like and, ta and are taught it. Um, but there's no notice, not, not no, no notice, but just no realization of, you know, via observation, like, like what you're saying, that it's like, you know, you see either like the fallen tree or the, the dry leaves or like, you know, the tiny carcass of, of a bug or um, a flesh, you know, um, little mammal or whatever that, you know, that it kind of breaks down in like such an interesting way until it is completely incorporated into the dirt again. And then other mm -hmm. things start growing out of that very same area. And then the, the, you know, it, transforms into the plants or just whatever it's food or like it's food for the plants or this type of stuff so it's kind of like incorporated as if there's just something there that is kind of just changing shape from one thing to another yes yeah, morphing and, into the next version of itself yeah yeah whether yeah whether it's the little animal like the little squirrel turning into a plant or turning into a tree or turning into a bug whatever it is and that's really cool um because, for example, it also makes me think a little bit of kind of like the spiritual aspect. Like, I mean, uh, I don't know if, if you were raised Catholic, but I was raised Catholic. Um, and there's this whole thing about about the next life and stuff. And it's like if you're an atheist or don't believe in an afterlife. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, if matter doesn't... I mean, you might have heard that in like physics or something. 
in school because I, I did. And it's like matter doesn't isn't like spontaneously created and the same thing with energy it's not spontaneously created it just changes uh, and yes. so does energy i think and and so it makes a you know and we have this whole thing you know again humans we have this whole thing about completely disregarded or, or kind of being a little bit dismissive maybe because we're afraid of it of the whole spiritual thing and it like if that happens to matter then i think it makes at least some degree of sense that it also happens to energy or the soul or whatever you know yeah. so like yeah yeah so like i like the idea a lot of that cyclical and you know maybe it's like the reincarnation like those other whomever i don't know who in thinks believes that but whatever either way it's cool <laughs> you know yes yeah yeah i guess i guess it, it makes yeah. sense to be i'm sorry go ahead sorry <laughs> sorry i was gonna say i i know exactly what you mean and i i can relate in that thinking of like maybe a particle of energy your life's energy whenever you your life is over becomes the energy for a new life yeah 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 that's that's pretty cool it's kind of difficult to think yeah. about in a way because there's kind of not very much information about it in a way yes <laughs> yeah it's one of those unobservable unobservable um things yeah. about i suppose so but you know um there's a quote that I haven't corroborated by Nikola Tesla or something that he said about how if we applied like the scientific method to those things that can't be kind of quantified like oh supernatural or paranormal or things that look supernatural or look paranormal and like this kind of soul type stuff like the psychological things that we don't understand then yeah so then you know what he's trying to say with that quote is that if we looked into those things, it's like we would advance leaps and bounds just like humanity in general. And that I think I strongly agree. And, you know, I think one of the reasons for which we neglect that stuff is because it's obviously so difficult and, you know, also kind of terrifying in a way. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because what happens if you uncover a truth you don't want to ever yeah. imagine? Yeah, it's like, who knows what the fuck you're going to find, you know? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, Mrs. Anderson, what is art in your opinion? Yeah, so I've prepared for this question. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and I think I have it. And it actually really ties in because it comes from, like, a, a, a biblical quote. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the Bible, um, it says that... Uh, God created man in his own image. And um, who knows what that actually even means. But uh, I have kind of come to the conclusion uh, that that means um, God uh, felt the need to create man and um, earth and, you know, all of existence. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that art is our reflection of God's image, you know, however you want to think oh, about yeah. that. Uh -huh. um, so in, in, you know, if we're created in God's image, we're all driven deeply within ourselves to create um, in whatever fashion that might be. But I think when uh, man or uh, human kind um, dives deep within themselves and they, they find something important important to their you know existence and they find a way to get that out that that is art okay well i like that a lot uh <laughs> i've been listening to some lectures by jordan peterson they're called i mean the series is called the psychological significance of the biblical stories and yes yeah, and, and, well, they're fucking awesome, and they're amazing, and mind-blowing, and um, they kind of reaffirm this thing that Jordan has mentioned. I mean, he hasn't specifically mentioned this thing about how, or, or like, I don't know, the sense of unity with not just humans that are alive, but humans that lived before. Um, you know, the ones that made all of these stories... Um, and just, they made those so that 
their future upcoming generations kind of knew how to behave, you know. Because, I mean, they say that about religion, uh, that it's kind of like a rudimentary law system in a way, sort of. And, you know, there is some of, there is some of that in it. But it's, it's of course, a lot, a lot deeper, deeper than that. What I'm trying to say, that's kind of like a tangential thing. But what I'm trying to say is that um, I like the parallel that you made between God's own creative impetus and how because he made us in his own image, then of course it makes perfect sense that we're going to have a creative desire as well. Because he has yes. it. Yes. Um, and I think I've listened to a few of your videos on your podcast. A lot of other people seem to say that art is somehow divine or has yeah. a divinity about it. Um, and I think oh, that yeah. that ties in well. Yes. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because... All right, give me a second. I want to try to... Because, <laughs> yeah, I want to try to, like, kind of say what you just said, but with my own words, and that forces me to think about it. Um, right, so, okay, so we are creative because, well, God basically was creative, or is creative as well, because he made all of these things. Um, yes. And then, so creation, that means that the act of creation, because... God did it or you know arguably was the first to do it I guess um and he's God <laughs> uh that means that creation itself is divine is that is that is it something like that does that seem right well yes um but I think it is that creative drive or energy or pursuit that pursuit of creating that comes from God directly, and that is divine. And so, because it it's like God's skill, and so yeah, he yeah. passes that on his image that he's passing on to human. Yes, yes, and, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so then the desire itself is more what's divine, more than the act itself, or would you say that both have? I mean, both are divine, and they're. Yeah, I almost want to say you can't have one without the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you could have the desire to create without the follow through. But I feel like that would be torturous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess people must have the desire for creating, you know. And I actually want to talk a little bit about the word create, creative, creativity itself because. And it's kind of ranty, I guess. <laughs> Just because I feel like lately, because of the whole issue of how murky the definition of art is, has because of how murky it's become, um, it's become so loaded to call oneself an artist that I feel like people are using the term, or I have the impression that people are using the term creative to still be an artist or still want to do creative things but then not have the load or the pressure that comes with being an artist and yes, and, yes yeah. go ahead go ahead i was gonna say i agree with you there's a line somewhere where it's like you're you're making something but are you creating art and where is that you know where do you draw that line around what is and isn't art yeah <laughs> And, and you know maybe maybe people want to wear that name tag that says artists without uh, having the work that comes with it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that I think that's why I try to include in my definition. Um, there's a desire to create something that is impactful within yourself. Mm -hmm. You know that has to do with your existence. Mm -hmm and your your experience living as a human being yeah or I, mean, I guess if there was other creatures that are conscious enough for it um but it's it's uh there you know there's something within i believe each person that struggles with existence mm -hmm. um you know the whole i didn't ask to be born um right. or whatever <laughs> that people say um and it feels like trying to discover your purpose 
why you're a part of the world or you know why things happen or really you know diving in yourself and digging out those those deeper struggles Mm -hmm. um i think that is a very important aspect of what makes art art Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i agree because what you're describing is very difficult and art making art is difficult yes but Um, yeah especially making good art go ahead sorry yeah it's difficult to address those things within yourself and then figure out what you think about them or feel about them and then how to translate that into art and then develop a skill that you can be proud of Mm. (laughs) yeah and that's and and that's really quite a lot what you're because like just the part about oh want uh, wanting to depict something and it's like so 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 like kind of having to face in a way like these things that are bothering the person that are you know the the whatever it is that you want to talk about in the work if it's something difficult that uh to deal with or i mean it doesn't always, it, it doesn't have to be like it doesn't have to be difficult uh, yeah. subject but yeah no, it could be that you find something extremely beautiful which i'm yeah. sure we'll talk about in a second yes and that impacts you in a deep way um right like why is it so beautiful to me and just feeling that deep draw to something and you know trying to recreate it or whatever um i think that is you know included in that yes grand scope (laughs) yes no no i i I definitely agree it's just that i think because because i don't know in a way in a way that's a little that like that on its own is difficult and then paired with making good work it's like just make just trying to make good work is really difficult yes you know yeah yeah i struggle with that too i'll i will work uh hundreds of hours on something and then i will step back and say is that even good i don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know it's you know it's i rendered it well maybe mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um composition might be nice but is this good does it exempt like does it show my idea well is it all of the things encompassed in the one that make art art yes yes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah and those are definitely good questions to, to ask oneself whilst making while the work is kind of forming you know yeah 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 and it's and it's um yeah sometimes it's definitely not nice to deal with what you might think because it's like oh what if what if indeed i'm working on this thing and i'm just having a hard time with an area and i think that it's just i'm just like am i because i mean that's definitely happened to me that i'm having a difficult time depicting something and i'm like maybe i shouldn't be an artist (laughs) it hasn't happened in a while but it happened it has happened you know (laughs) yeah and we rely so much too as artists you know we rely on other people to buy the our feedback or yeah. comment or yeah all of the things come at least see it you know yes and if you don't even want to just come see it <laughs> yes you're kind of what am i doing this for yes yes yeah yeah and that's yeah and i think i think that's a large part of why specifically the feedback from other people whether that feedback is in the form of a critique or or just a comment or purchasing the work, um, you know, it makes sense that would be scary. And it makes yeah. a lot of sense that people often would get either, you know, butthurt or just like, oh, what do you know about art? Or, you know, something like that. Like have yeah. a bad reaction, and, you know. Yeah. Making art in general is really hard in that aspect, uh, being raw in front of people. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm not sure, and now that you mentioned the part about the, the raw part, um, I'm not entirely sure why it feels that way. Because, you know, when else I kind of feel that way, sort of? Um, when I make food? <laughs> and for what... I do t- Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know how that works, and I've thought that maybe it has something to do with how competent I feel at doing whatever it is. So I definitely feel more feel more competent at drawing than I do at cooking, even though I've gotten pretty good at cooking. But 
you know, like I'm very aware in drawing, for example, like where I need to polish my skill, like I'm aware where my weaknesses are. And for example, if my husband tells me something negative about a drawing or something, and he's like, I don't understand what's happening here. It's like, what does that mean? You know, I don't, I never take it, you know, there's no offense ever. It's like, I want to hear everything he has to say about the drawing because he's the smartest person I know. And of course it's going to make my drawing better. And you let, there's not that sense of kind of vulnerability versus occasionally when, when he hasn't, and not, you know, when he, I don't know, when there's something about the food, I will get like super butt hurt sometimes, you know, <laughs> and like, I'm aware that I, I'm wrong, you know, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm the same way. Um, <laughs> and I think a lot of that has to do with us, who you're making it for. Okay. Um, because with food, it's like definitely not a self-serving thing mm. always. Like if you're making food for someone else. And that's definitely me. I love to cook also, and I think I'm good. <laughs> um, and so if my husband doesn't like leave me a raving five-star yeah. review after, <laughs> like what was wrong with it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I think it's really because I'm, I make it for him and that is a gift and I'm, you know, devoting my time and my mental capacity and my skill and all this, you know, history of time that I've worked on to develop my ability to cook. I'm doing it for you. It's a gift for you. Please love it. And then they open the gift and it's like, eh, I wish it was something else. You know, uh, I would be a butthurt about that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just that, it's just that it isn't because. I don't know, and I don't know, it has something to do with mood as well, because other times I'm like, tell me everything with the food. And then, and then he's, so like, I'm sure, you know, critique actually means analysis, meaning that you, the person doing the yeah. critique talks about both good and things, that, good things and things that can be improved, mm -hmm. right? So then critique usually has like this negative connotation of just like shitting on the thing, um, yeah. right? for whatever reason. But anyway, the thing is that sometimes the, if I'm like like ovulating when I'm in a really good mood, um, I'll be like, I wanna know everything that you think about this food that I made for you. And then he like breaks it down and he's, and he like, yeah, next, you know, there, there could also be this, but then this is really good and stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's very interesting, you know? But then if I'm like, if I'm like on my period, for example, uh, and, and and he will, I don't know, whatever, like I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, should talk my husband or anything. I'm just saying that it's like a me thing and talking and like comparing it to the, like the competence that I feel with drawing versus cooking and, and why there's something about the creative act, like the making of something, because I mean, artwork is also for someone else. When? Yes. Well, it's all for yourself. What? It, but it is also for yourself. Yes. But then, but you know, then I feel like there's some kind of overlap as well in that sense with making food because you want to accomplish a good meal, you know, as a, yes. you know, it, some, something like, I don't know, what do you think? I think another thing is uh, everyone knows how to eat and taste food and everyone has a great experience, you know, like a lifetime, lifetime's worth of experience doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's, you know, everyone has things that they like or don't like or, right. um, observations about food in general that they can bring to a critique but somebody who has like negative one art experience like my husband uh -huh. <laughs> if he's like this doesn't look right i think something needs to change in this area and he can't pinpoint it mm -hmm. or whatever i'm like who are you to tell me what's wrong with my art <laughs> <laughs> but no uh i think that has a lot to do with it um just like the level of experience someone has telling you how to do, you know, you a professional, how mm -hmm. to do. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, okay. Um, all right, Mrs. Anderson, what is beauty in your opinion? This one for me is like way harder to answer than the art thing. I haven't figured it out. Um, you know, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and mm -hmm. I have held a beat, so I'm probably right. <laughs> um, just kidding. Uh, but it's there is a lot of synonyms to beauty, like gorgeous or pretty or whatever. 
Um, but there's something about beauty that's a little bit different. Um, and I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it doesn't have to be visual. Yeah, uh, it can be um, a moment in time, uh, ex observing someone's relationship, the life and death cycle of the forest floor, I find very beautiful. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Van Minen, and a lot of times he depicts things that aren't pretty, but I find them so beautiful, and I don't know if it's his absolute just masterful ability to render things or the colors that mm. he uses. I don't even know what it is, but I find it beautiful. And it's like not even, it's like a weird flesh blob that's like farting yeah. and there's gummy. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, it's so beautiful. I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, but it's there and it's in the moment that a child is born and it's in the moment that someone takes their last breath and it's in the moment, you know, like the sun is shining through the window in a certain way and it looks like the air is gold in that section of the air. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is, but it's beautiful. And I don't know what it is that makes it beautiful, mm -hmm. but I, I do know I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair description and muse about it, and I'm glad that you didn't, basically didn't go with beauty as an eye of the beholder, and instead you made it into a pun, which was really funny. Um, <laughs> I, I don't care for when somebody uses that as the definition for beauty, because it's not a definition. Um, yes. Um, it's a non-definition. Right, it's like a cop-out. Um, yes. But what would you say you feel when you're experience when you're experiencing or you know contemplating the 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 forest floor or the you know this type of stuff? What would you say you feel? I think it's definitely one of those things where it's like you stop everything else mm -hmm. that you're doing mm -hmm. and just experience the moment or you know the thing that you're seeing or if you're listening to a story or something, you just forget about everything else. You stop taking visual input from the side of your periphery, peripherals. Um, you are, you know, you stop, and if you're walking in the woods and there's something particularly beautiful, you just stop and admire it. Um, and I think it's like a bit of breath, breathlessness. Um, and, but maybe it's like not happiness but like joy mm -hmm. perhaps or sometimes sorrow um but it's just one of those uh things that just makes you stop and experience well what would you say is the difference between joy and happiness um i think uh happiness comes from uh exterior I don't know how to, how do I explain the difference between joy and happiness? I, I want to say like joy is uh, something within your soul and happiness is like within your body. There's like something that, um, but uh, I, I think joy comes from something deeper. Um, I, it maybe is connected to a, a bit of pride or something. I don't know. Pride? Um, yeah. Oh, interesting. I think uh, um, happiness can come from receiving a present or, uh, you know, hearing some good news. But uh, joy maybe comes from a satisfaction from doing something or experiencing something that's a little bit deeper. I don't know. Okay. How to? I don't know how to define it. Um. um but, but yeah. Would you say then that that joy comes from within, and then happiness comes from exterior things? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think so. Um, I think you can receive joy from something that's outside of yourself. Mm. For instance, mm -hmm. you know, a beautiful 
scene that you look at. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's something inside of you that's responding to that versus an external like stimulus. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, maybe like a a bit of uh, thankfulness for the moment or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. It's hard to explain. Indeed. Okay. Um, yeah, these things, uh, this, I guess this is the part or kind of more like what Tesla would be like, because it's, it's, they're yeah. abstract. Yes. Uh, maybe we don't have the tools to observe it, but it's there. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're right. Um, um, what do you think it is about something that you find beautiful that it kind of demands almost for you to stop and kind of invest time with it? It's a good question. I have to think about it for just a second. Maybe it's the divinity that makes people want to create or that makes art art that we talked about earlier. Um, maybe there is some sort of uh, unobservable higher power within something that's beautiful. Mm. Um, maybe because it's been created by God. Mm. I don't know. Um, but it feels like there's something powerful about something being beautiful and the fact that you said that it commands you to look at it I think kind of speaks to that mm. um, yeah I think that would be why mm. if I dig it yes um, maybe the you know maybe the term demand is kind of inaccurate because I think the person the individual who is uh, looking at what could be kind of like the conduit to an experience of beauty has to kind of be willing to stop first because, I mean, because you have like the classic, oh, stop and smell the roses, you know? It's like, you have to stop first. It's like, you have to want to stop first because obviously if you're, if, if you're, he ah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I said yes. What is it about smelling the roses? that makes you want to stop and smell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then I think because, I mean, I don't smell all the flowers, but sometimes I do. And it's like, um, I recently learned of some of the smells of roses indeed. And it's like, it's totally worth stopping to smell them just because it's such a, pecu it's, I don't know, it's like a plant smell, but it's kind of like perfume, but it's not like perfume. It's like the rose and to, it's like to me, the fact that the rose can even emit that smell, it's like, what? You know, there's been a few things recently that I learned exist in nature and I'm like, oh, of course it exists in nature first because we fucking, you know, we haven't invented anything really. It's just derived from an observation of nature. It's like, I don't know if you knew, but seltzer water exists in nature. Okay, first of all. Second of all, the bypass, you know, the heart bypass for people with heart issues, mm -hmm. um, like heart, uh, what's it called? Just like heart disease. The bypass is when they kind of make like a bridge from the heart itself to like another part of the artery or whatever. So that the, like that bridge is the bypass of the, like the blockage of the artery. So like mm -hmm. sometimes that just happens in people. It's like sometimes the person's body will make the bypass and it's like That's oh very right and it's like and it's like oh of course we fucking copied the bypass from nature it's like of course we fucking copied it you know yes and 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 uh, i just think that's really cool because it's i did go ahead sorry <laughs> i just said i do too i was yeah no i just did... yeah i'm total i'm totally ranting i just think that we tend to underestimate 
and take for granted like those things from nature so very much and and not just take it for granted and but but also like even have like a negative relationship and just be dismissive like of the body of nature itself and take it for granted and be like so belittling of 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 the of you know the body and nature and then be like yeah it's just that the body is weak and we have to have metal skin and be really strong or be fast like a calculator and this kind and it's like oh my god the ai and the art images and it's like can you, it's like you remember where those things remember what they are based on okay <laughs> they're based on yes. the body they're based on nature it's like these would not exist without the first one being there you know and it's just frustrating for me <laughs> not to mention not to mention the fact that we do not know the potential of the body or of nature we have little information about both so it's like because we don't know the potential it's like we don't know what the limit of anything basically yes you know um. it's just frustrating for me so that's why i rant about it <laughs> i can understand the frustration <laughs> So I've thought about it a little bit more, and I think uh, maybe the reason why we stop to smell the roses is because we're inspired by them. Mm. Um, uh, because they're beautiful, because they smell beautiful, and it's kind of like, is that is this a real life? Like, mm. I get to experience this real life yes yes um, and it's like when you really sit and look you th and think about all the different things like the the mantis shrimp that can like see a million times more colors oh. than humans that was yeah a bit of exaggeration but and they can like punch so hard that they break the sound barrier <laughs> and they're just like a bug on the ocean floor um it's like is that there are aliens among us. <laughs> yes, thank you. I was gonna. I was gonna say. I was gonna say that very thing as well. Or like I have said it. Um, not in this conversation. Just like in other conversations where it's like, oh, we're 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 like here in our little planet Earth trying to reach out there for stuff. And it's like, have you seen plants and bugs yeah. and like even yeah. even cats? It's like they're aliens. It's like they're all alien. They totally defy gravity. I yeah. don't understand cat. <laughs> yeah, um, but I think maybe uh, taking those in gives us um, an appreciation for being alive and yes. helps us realize why we're alive and living and experiencing all of these things, positive and negative, that accumulate into something beautiful. Yes. Yes. Well, I like that quite a lot as the closing for the episode, Mrs. Anderson, because we have broken the 55 minute mark um, of your uh, our conversation today. So um, why don't you tell, you know, if you want to add anything, um, what do you have coming up that you're excited about? What projects are you working on? Yeah, actually tomorrow I'm delivering some art to a nearby gallery called the Graceful Arts Gallery in Alva, Oklahoma. Um, okay. So if you are in Alva in December, you can go see my art in person. Um, otherwise, it's pretty much always on display at Larry K. Hill Studios. Um, and then you guys can find me on social media. It's Amber Anderson Art wherever you look. And then my website is amberandersonart.com. Easy peasy. Lovely. Okay. All right. So, um... Well, thank you, Amber, very, very much for your time and your patience today. Um, I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Please remember to like and share this video and subscribe to my audiovisual channel. All of the links uh, pertaining to uh, supporting the podcast, Amber's work, uh, and myself will be in the description, uh, caption, description, whatever you want to call it. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a fantastic day. Thank you very much for watching and listening and reading. Bye. <laughs>